You ready to go back? Lexicon nearly jumped at the sound of Oso's voice. But nearly at a whimper, she answered with the fullest extent of her heart. Yes, please. No more wolves. No more confusing nonsense. Oso chuckled and looked back into the hollow containing the overly talkative oracle. Well, if it's any comfort, I don't know what the hell she's talking about either. Lexicon grumbled, looking up at him. Was that crap supposed to make sense? You are, but you aren't. You are something, but simultaneously you are not. Are all wolves like this? Um, weird? Oso grinned and shook his head. She is pretty strange. Her mother was easier to deal with. But on another note, we have their assistance on our group's project. We have been trying to do this for a very long time. But they'll only help us if you are involved. I hope you do not have any changes of heart. This is very important. Lexi poked at the ground, grumbling, trying to figure out why the snow was ten feet thick everywhere but inside the city. The massive tree didn't have so much as a single flake of snow on it. Checking her radiation often, she had discovered the surrounding area was strangely free of that as well. But one thing dug at her mind, and she knew the answer she would get. But she needed to ask. Oh, so... What is this project? Oso smiled, and just like she knew he would, he shook his head. Sorry, that's not something I can just up and tell you. Maybe you convince Tyron when we meet back up. Despite the oddities all around, if she agreed and went along with it, she would be taking part in something bigger again. And with the world dead, she didn't really have anything else to go back to. Okay, but... I am owed an explanation eventually. Oso paused for a moment, then nodded, and Kroos landed just a little ways away. Can we get the hell out of here? These furballs are weird as shit. They don't even have ammo or weapons for sale. Hell, they won't even sell me food! Oso chuckled. They won't take caps, and they don't like outsiders. He stood taller and started off towards the market. But he slowed and looked back waiting for both Lexi and Kroos. Lexi hurried to his side, and Kroos grumbled, moving to follow Lexi. They both moved through the markets until they came upon an old wolf at a forge. What looked to be either his younger sister or possibly his mate stood beside him, carefully working on something at a table. Also approached and said one or two things with the odd guttural tongue, and the old wolf smiled, sticking his hand in the forge. Lexi's attention was fully on the wolf, and her mouth dropped open when he pulled out a white, glowing hot hunk of iron with his bare hands. He placed it on the anvil and fetched a hammer as well as some shaped tongs. Hammering the item and applying various different treatments, eventually he dropped it into a small bowl, where it hissed loudly and bubbled whatever fluid the bowl held. Then he passed it to the wolfess. Gross. Can I see your gun? Oso's talon extended, and Crow stared almost in mistrust, but he sighed and ejected the clip and cleared the chamber before handing it over. Oso, in turn, held the item out to the wolfess, who smiled at him, then frowned at the gun. But she looked over at Kroos and shook her head. No. I will make new weapons or armor, but we do not service coward weapons. Kroos cocked his head and stared at the old wolf. And Oso promptly returned the gun to Crows before the wolfess pulled out a knife and fiddled with it thoroughly and handed it to Oso. Oso tossed it to Crows, who looked it over. He hefted its weight and inspected its edge before grinning. It's a bit big, but I won't say no. The old wolf handed off the small trinket, still cooling to the wolfess, and she started up on them as well. Oso watched with a soft smile on his features and muttered, Nothing beats Susie Steele. I can name a few griffins who would disagree. Kroos leaned in with his voice low. Birds build good armor and complicated coward weapons, but none have finer steel than the Susie. The wolfist chimed in almost with a growl as she worked. Coward weapon? Kroos asked as he looked over her, fitting the magazine back into his pistol and finding a place for his new knife. Oso nodded, 
But the old wolf answered, Yes, don't take it too personally. We just like to call it that. One can master the blade or magic. It takes decades of power and focus. Infant can use coward weapon to kill anything. No mastery, death of art, death of beauty. He grumbled. We do not work on coward weapons. Kroos looked to be willing to say more, but he just surrendered the thought. Finally, the wolfess handed the small trinkets to Oso, who made his way over and slipped them under Lexi's collar. Don't lose them. Those suckers are very valuable. But what are they? She placed a hoof on her collar, where the little pieces of metal rested between the fur and her clothing. Don't worry. If you ever actually need them, you'll realize pretty quick what they're for. He turned and gave a soft bow to the wolves and held out a handful of what looked like metal cubes. But they shook their heads and turned away, going right back to work. Oso smiled and gave another bow, a little deeper this time, and turned back to Lexi. Okay, now we move on. The trip out was surprisingly fast. Lexi was certain that they would have to check out or be guided or escorted, but they just left. The wolves seemed busy with their daily lives and Lexicon couldn't place it, but it simply felt odd. The wolves were so dedicated to escorting them like they were criminals, all the way to the Oracle, but now they were just being ignored as they all but left the city. I have to say... Kroos' voice was steady as his wings carried him softly through the air behind them. His eyes locked on the blade he had received. Despite how weird those guys are, it's refreshing to see plants and trees with leaves. A steady community and... Oh, that's right. How the hell do they keep the radiation out? Oso shrugged. I believe it's some sort of ritual combined with influencing the weather patterns. But I honestly don't know. Weather patterns? How can they manipulate that? I assume it's something different than Pegasi. Lexi smiled, thinking of little winged wolves dancing around in the clouds, pushing them around and frolicking about. Then they all turned in the distant sound of screams and roaring. In the distant tree line, they could just barely make out something large, bursting through the trees, covered in wolves who repeatedly stabbed at it, trying to bring the beast down. The image in her head flashed to them prancing over blood-stained clouds, and she shut it down. The druids have some weather control. It's not flawless, but it does have a good grasp. Granted, no bombs dropped here, but the glowing tundra and that big storm should have killed everything up here. Amazingly, while most of the trees are dead, you can still find a lot of them alive, even if they are mostly buried in snow. If you haven't noticed... The snow gets more and more shallow the further away from the city we get. Oso dragged his talon through the snow in the depth. Crow slashed at a low-hanging branch and smiled as easily the new knife passed through the wood easily. Still, the wolves are weird as shit and kind of spooky. I mean, what the hell do they even do up here? Oso laughed softly as he picked up the pace. Live. He paused and helped Lexi up a larger snowbank. They have their own problems, like rival clans, the cursed blood, wildlife, that kind of stuff. Ever since their king left just before the bombs, they split into various clans. I don't know why. Maybe it was a power grab. Maybe it was religious differences. Maybe it was just what they do. Whatever it was, the clans are picky about which other clans they deal with. And even then, usually, they don't get along with each other very well. In the cursed blood, they rebelled, basically. At the very moment, the king of the north valanged. Cursed blood? Lexi asked. She didn't quite like the thought of something with that name. It was not the first time it has been said, but she didn't like the sound of it. Don't worry. They have a blood feud with a Susie. They won't likely attack us. No point in it. He trudged away through the snow, ensuring he left a trail for Lexi to trot through. But what are they? Crow sounded a little curious himself as he slid his new, very large knife into a place beside his machete. Oso sighed, but answered nevertheless. A smaller crossbeed, Susie. They don't have the same durability or size, and unlike Susie, they use guns. 
But you don't have to worry very much. They're usually sickly weak and not very intelligent. They used to have some actual position in the culture of the North. But when the king left, the Susie took up some old grudges. The cursed blood all have one common ancestor who was... Well, let's just say not very well liked. And well, with the king gone, they were not afraid of stepping up and complaining about being second-class citizens in the North. Now they are more or less raiders that won't attack unless they have overwhelming numbers. Lexi looked up at him, hoping for more information, but frowning when he didn't continue. But she flinched heavily when he tossed something to her. There was a short laugh from Kroos and a sigh from Oso as she fumbled and dropped the item, digging it out of the snow and went to find it was a 10mm pistol. What? She wasn't too sure of herself, holding the weapon in her hooves. It wasn't until Kroos nudged her playfully. Hey, mud pony, keep up, and I'll teach you as we go along. But just so you know, with that pip buck, you have a massive advantage over most others in the wasteland. She raised an eyebrow as she struggled to walk and hold the weapon at the same time. She ejected, elected to hold it into her mouth as she moved to catch up. The crow swiped it from her mouth quickly. Hold up. No doing stupid shit, I. I don't want to get shot in the ass because you don't know where the safety is. There was a short lesson in the anatomy of a pistol before a rundown of her pip buck. She'd almost forgotten about the bars at the bottom of her vision. Most things outside the influence of her glasses were just a blur anyway. Pushing her glasses up, she peered at the bottom of her vision to see two blue bars and a small hoofful of yellow bars all over. Aye, it's a handy tool, though you have a powerful tool right here. Sats. He gestured to the pip buck. I don't know exactly what this extra shit on the side of your pip buck is, but you should be able to figure this out. I mean... You're not too bright, but I think you aren't completely retarded. She glared at him, but he just chuckled. So, what is this sats thing? He peeked at the screen, trying to get a look at the menu, more trying to dig for answers, which escaped him at the moment. It's something like, um, strategic something ass something strategy. Stable Tech Arcane Targeting Spell? Lexi's eyes were tied to the screen and Kroos peeking back in again to see she had pulled it up on the pip buck. She felt she was useless in combat, but if it came down to reading and knowledge, she felt like taking the world into half. Yeah, just fucking do that then. Kroos sped up a little, poking around ahead of them as Lexi read more and more. After getting a quick rundown on the basic systems of her pip buck, her eyes couldn't tell but peeked down at the bars, watching some very slowly move around, others bobbing left and right quickly. Something teased her mind, and she looked back and saw nothing. With a soft sigh, she picked up the pace and caught up to Oso in the bitter cold, only to wait for Kroos to return. She was sure that Oso could answer her questions, but she didn't want to annoy him more. Kroos, no matter how odd it was to her, was still being more or less bound to her by his self-imposed contract. And she didn't mind bugging him back after all the teasing and mockery she endured. So, about the pistol? Gross looked over and sighed. Read your shit and find sats, and once you get that crap figured out, I'll teach you how to fire and maintain the sucker. He looked over at a small bird and gestured towards it. Here. Shoot that. The little birdie. Her heart sank, and she earned a nearly disgusted look from Kroos. If you can't kill a single pest, how the shit are you going to defend yourself from a slaver or a raider? Hell, how are you going to fight back at all? Shoot the damn thing! One set of talons swatted the back of her head, and the other pointed at the bird perching on a small branch. She winced, and quite suddenly the world went still. She opened her eyes to see the bird highlighted and marked with a simple 23%. She found herself unable to move or even speak. She just fiddled around with the spell linked to her before finally she built up what she could only guess was a small queue of shots. There was an odd sensation and her whole body went tense as if some pony was puppeteering her every action. 
What little muscles she had went taut, and her teeth sensed over the grip of the pistol. Her tongue toyed the trigger, and she popped off three shots in quick succession. But the bird remained untouched, and it fluttered away and took off. Oso smirked. I'm not usually a gun guy, but hey, at least she got close. Close only counts in horseshoes and grenades. Crow spat out before he sighed and drew his knife. Making a little circle with a... Uh, on the tree, he stepped back. All right, mud pony. Just aim at the circle, line up the sights, and hit the trigger. Nervously looking at the circle, she lined up the sights. She had just fired with sats. How could this be any different? She made sure it lined up and clenched her eyes shut before hitting the trigger but she promptly yelped as the gun went off and simultaneously flew out of her mouth. Kroos looked over at the unmarked tree and sighed loudly. This is gonna take a while. My teeth hurt. Oso chuckled and Kroos was on the verge of just starting to yell at the young earth pony until she finally followed his instructions properly. Clench your damn teeth over the grip then. If your grip is loose, then the recoil will get you. It had only been an hour. They had been casually popping back and forth through the woods, stopping every few minutes at a time. Oso was trying to find the entrance back into the caves. He had remarked about it being significantly easier than searching on the other side, but at least he could casually go about it, knowing the Susie patrols were very unlikely to attack them in any capacity. Mexicon whimpered and spat out the gun, wanting something to wipe her tongue off with. The gun had been cleaned and worked on, but it still was unnerving for her to stick a 170-year-old rusty pistol in her mouth. It was bad enough that she hadn't had a bath in 170 years, but this was just a little too much. Firing sats was pretty easy. Her whole body tensed when the spell took over, but whenever she fired without it, the spell rattled her jaw and chipped her teeth. First chance we get, we're getting a harness for her. Cross's beak made an audible sound as it grinded in his anger. And a suppressor. I would be just a little more comfortable knowing less potential enemies hear gunshots as we make our way around. Oso said, looking back over the horizon. The end of this was still Susie territory, and they very clearly did not like the guns. He didn't want to offend them any more than he had already, though he knew that there was more than just Susie here. But he was keeping an eye out. Can we stop now? I mean... I'm thankful for your help, but I just think that guns aren't for me. Lexi rubbed her jaw, almost tempted to down a healing potion or at least sip on some so her teeth would stop hurting. On the bright side, she got decent with sats, especially since it did everything for her. Mud pony, do you know what happens to ponies that can't fight? Rose fluttered up and rested on the tree branch. You remember those slavers, right? Do you know what'll happen to you if you run into them again and can't fight them off? Chances are that they'll rape you. Then they'll sell you to someone else who'll do the same thing over and over and over again till you either die of some disease or they kill you for fun. Lexi's heart sank and just the thought of such a fate made her sick. She shuddered with dread at the thought. It made her want to be quiet and keep training. But it looked as though Crows was not quite finished putting the fear into her. And that's just the slavers. Raiders will probably put a few bullet holes in you first. Well, I've seen more than a few raiders turned cannibal. And I'm sure you've thought of what a mutated monster will do. Just eat you, tear you to pieces, and swallow you whole. Mercenaries will likely kill you for any little thing you might have. Hell, I've had a fellow mercs try and kill me in my sleep, just for the possibility I had some spare ammo. And while it's rare for griffins, I've seen a few who will eat pony meat if it's convenient. There's a thousand and one things out here that'll kill you. Unless... He glared at her, even though she had already basically been scared into a shivering pile of little earth pony on the floor. Pick up your damn gun and learn to fucking shoot! Lexi popped up and deliberately fumbled with her gun clenching it into her teeth as hard as she could and whimpering as Crows came down and pointed just past her from behind, designating a little carved circle. Closing an eye, she watched the iron sights of the pistol sway back and forth until the front sights lined up with the rear. 
She clenched her eyes and hit the trigger. There was a loud pop, but her teeth clenched tighter and she opened her eyes. There was a hole in the tree. Certainly not in the center, but at least it was on the target. Finally! Well, there you go, mud pony. You can shoot almost accurately. Crow shook his head and grumbled. It was a success. But had been quite testing for his limited patience and something he did not want to have to repeat. Kroos. Oso's voice was almost a surprise to both Lexi and Kroos. Lexi just flinched, her adrenaline still blasting through her. Kroos, though, looked over and grumbled even more. Hey, I got her to shoot without knocking any of her teeth out. He grinned and added, Also, the recoil didn't crack her teeth. Oso was not smiling. This sent a puzzled look across his face. They were very different but so far they've been able to enjoy a joke or two at Lexi's expense. Pack it up. For the past twenty or so minutes, the Susie have been fighting something down there. Whatever it is, it's running away. I figure nothing down there would be interested in us, but they're coming this way and fast. Crows looked over at Lexi, and her heart shot up into her throat. Please don't tell me you're going to make me follow you into battle. Hell the fuck no. I wouldn't even do that if you were literally my only hope. He drew his new knife and his pistol. See that shit over there? He gestured with a blade to a dying thicket next to a short cliff. Go over there. They'll have to bottleneck in order to get to you. If any of them come after you, use sats every chance you get. But overall, just put bullets into them until they stop moving. She looked at Oso, who just nodded and reinforced her confidence simply by pointing at the small confined area. She slowly started in the direction, only to let out a yelp and run when Kroos's talon swatted her on the rear. Faster, mud pony! She bolted to the little hiding spot, and she didn't look twice before pouncing into the spot off the somewhat beaten path. She was quite surprised that she sank into the snow up to her shoulders. She remembered making snow forts with her mother in the neighborhood fillies, and Colts refused to play with her due to her less-than-stellar ability to throw snowballs or even run. Though the general idea she went with was to stomp out all of the snow she could to give her enough room to duck low and move about while still having both line of sight on the bottleneck and a way to stay generally out of sight. She nearly whimpered, just standing there as still as possible in the frozen snow. But to her surprise, the cold didn't really get to her. She could even feel the her ears and the tips of her nose. It was surprising to her, but she only spent a few seconds marveling at it. Her attention was elsewhere as gunshots rang out and the sound of battle being joined by two griffins filled her ears. Chewing her lip, she carefully listened. She had seen how ungodly terrifying Oso was in battle with his bare talons, but she knew he had weapons. The old uh, bulbous weapons affixed with bladed pick. She was confident that she would be safe. But unfortunately, her heart sank and fear shot up inside of her as she heard a voice. Nair, see, tracks. The birds bring fight to our brothers. Think we won't search behind them. Small tracks, maybe child. The voice was higher pitched and felt slimy, like it belonged to a cartoon bad guy's minion. And so did the other voice. Will be food. Take it, yes. Take it before the birds come back. Lexicon's heart thundered in her chest. She really didn't want to move. She really didn't want to use her gun. She didn't want to fight. But the feeling bubbled inside of her chest told her that if she didn't, she would die. His pony. His female pony. She looked up at what was clearly a very small Susie. Clearly a wolf, but half the size. It was sickly thin, with patches of fur clearly missing and armed with a sharpened stick and armored with a scrap metal. But the look on her face told her that she would likely lose more than her life if they captured her. Ah, fun, then food. The second one grinned, wide, easily expanding to her what fun meant. She leaped up and clenched her eyes shut as she fired wildly. She didn't want to kill them, but far more than the desire not to take her life. 
She really didn't want to get raped and eaten by whatever these creatures were. The first few shots missed, but she got two hits in. Granted, they were grazes, but the smaller wolves shrieked and backpedaled before the one behind her raised a weapon she didn't expect. A very large rifle rested its hands, and the weapon was leveled right at her. Instantly, the world froze, and she fired up sats. She queued up the maximum required shots that she could on his head. She activated the spell and watched as a flurry of emotional pain and confusion as the pistol fired, digging a bloody furrow into the wolf's cheek. Then, again, once in his neck at the close range. Then again, dead center in his head. His lifeless body flew back like a rag doll. But then came the rushing scare of her young life. The first wolf pounced on her, striking her square in the jaw. The blow knocked her pistol free. Dazed and still full of fear, she backpedaled, desperately as the creature continued advancing. She turned and tried to flee, but the wolf's claws caught her by the leg, and his hand forced her head into the snow as she forcefully peeled back her snow clothes. Stupid pony! You learn! You learn now! A desperate thought crossed her mind, and she queued up all of her sat's attacks as she could. It was just one, but she really couldn't miss, as she looked back to ensure she had eyes on their target. She triggered the attack, and could feel her hoof kick savagely into the wolf's groin. She watched in slow motion as the creature howled, but oddly the slow motion didn't stop. Truly hoped that she would get a chance to run, but something else surprising happened as the wolf's head popped like a zit. It simply exploded into a rain of viscera. From under the wolf, she could barely make out a figure dressed in a trench coat, a heavy revolver floating in his magical grip. A shower of blood, brain matter, and tattered skull rained down on her as time returned to its normal pace. Panic already blasted through her. She rapidly scooted back, her head whipping back and forth looking for the unicorn that had just saved her. But fortunately, not only could she not see him, but her gaze shot skyward and she felt the sickening tingle of freefall. She had scooted herself off the cliff. Falling with a loud scream, she flailed and tumbled all the way down before, to her great surprise, she landed face first into a heavy snowbank. The fall had been incredibly short, but now she was head first stuck in the snow. Still, very much overwhelmed, she pouted and squirmed. She couldn't wrap her head around what had just happened. She had killed another living being. She'd almost gotten raped, and someone had just barely saved her. Then she survived falling off a cliff. Now she just wanted to go home. Doing her best to scoop back and forth, she suddenly went still, renewing the shock as her, in her heart as she felt something. She very, very clearly felt something, or some pony touching her, touching her butt. Clenching her eyes tight, she screamed and bucked as hard as she could, Thankfully, her hooves made full contact, and she could hear something exclaiming loudly before there was nothing else. Struggling for a few more moments, she popped out of the snow and quickly pulled up her snow trousers. She didn't know if it was the adrenaline or that she had just gotten used to the cold, but she didn't even feel a single tremble, even with snow practically stuffed into her nose. Though it was a little more surprising to her that her glasses were again still resting on her nose. Blinking, she pulled them off, and, not surprisingly, the world fell into a blur. She quickly put them back on and shook her head, almost trying to brush them off, but they remained right where she had set them. There was a delightful distraction from the hell she was currently in. She desperately kept her mind from racing through the events that had just unfolded. She remembered a young griffin telling her, That's just the wasteland. Distractions. Is that really how you like to live? Is that how every pony deals with his hell? She pushed the glasses up her nose and looked down at the hole in the snow she had just pulled herself from. But she shook her head and let her mind wander before turning around to survey the surroundings, looking for the unknown person she had kicked for grabbing her tush. A shock ran through her as something landed right beside her. She turned and swung her hooves to the terror and fright. It caught her hooves and tumbled her through the air before planting a paw on the back of her neck diving her face first into the snow. None of that, mud pony. How'd you get down here? Instantly, she teared up as his paws came off of her. 
She pounced and wrapped her forelegs around him. Gross. Get the fuck off. She pushed her back and grumbled loudly. I'm sorry. I... I just... It's... She floundered with her words as she pinched her mouth shut. I know. I saw the tracks and the dead wolves. Congrats. It looks like there is some sort of hope for you. He held up her pistol and popped the magazine out. Swapping it out, he handed it back to her, and she gratefully took it. Where's Oso? She looked around, only noticing that Kroos had the wolf's rifle over his back. He's wrapping up what's left and chasing them back towards the Susie. He pointed back towards the village where they'd come from. What? What are those things? She looked up at the cliff where she'd fallen from. She didn't want to see one of those little wolves again. Oso calls them cursed blood. Apparently, they were the peasant cattle in the north before the war. Some sort of legendary event which left them eternally stuck as the peasants. But when the bombs dropped, they rebelled, and the Susie hunt them for sport or something like that. But on a side note, I know why they call guns coward weapons now. He unslung the rifle and popped open a large hatch, leading directly to the chamber from the top of the rifle. The cursed blood are stupid cowardly, and these guns fire something really close to an anti-machine rifle round. Hell, the round looks identical, save for the fact that it's crudely made. Still freaking sweet find. He flicked the hinged door with a happy grin, and pushed an old and certainly homemade-looking bullet into the chamber, then snapped it shut. I think it's called a trapdoor rifle. I've heard of them, but... Yeah. His voice trailed off as he looked at her as she nearly blubbered. She was extremely happy that he was here. It felt odd to her, seeing such a rude griffin as the highlight of her day. But she couldn't help it. She knew that whether he intended it or not, he had saved her before, and now he was saving her from her own trauma. The moment was interrupted as Oso landed with a massive thud his weight forcing his talons through the snow and into the tra rocks below. His armor was scuffed and Lexi could see, rapidly closing holes on his chest and arms. She couldn't tell if healing potions were fixing small or very large injuries. There was no blood or, so she felt, it was a little more likely small wounds. You all right? Lexi nodded. The fear was ebbing away and Oso looked over at her, as well as the snow around her. He paused as if deeply thinking, but just shrugged. Aye, let's go. We have to get home to deliver this news. He reached out and picked her up before flying back to the top of the cliff. Squirming the whole way up, Lexi closed her eyes as they passed over the dead wolves. But she was reminded. Ah, Oso, a pony was here. He helped me out, but he ran off. Oh? Is that so? He put her down right where she had seen him. The snow had it was shallow on the path, but still she couldn't see any tracks other than their own that they were currently making, or some general disturbances. Yeah, he was right here. He shot that wolf over there. She pointed and Oso gave her a firm pat on the head. More of a reason for us to leave. Just be thankful that you are lucky enough to get that kind of help. He gave a firm push, and they started to look back towards the cave again. They moved with purpose, wanting to avoid that kind of combat again, and in their search, Lexicon regaled them of the details. Crow seemed interested, despite her leaving out the part where the wolf was trying to get into her. He didn't ask many questions, but he had plenty of advice for the next time. Oso, however, remained silent. He moved sternly, and his eyes remained sharp. It was unclear on whether or not he was just in a foul mood, or some other reason, or now that he had the Susie's help, he didn't want to lose it by losing Lexicon. Either way, he seemed on edge and perhaps a little grumpy that she had been attacked while he was away. The Oracle did say that she would help Oso's group because of Lexicon, and, best as she could figure, it took ages for him to get this deal, long enough that he was expecting to sh show up, get turned down, and then leave all the same to go. Her mind continued to race as the sun began to set, just as they came across the trail leading to the cave. 
She could not wait to get out of the snow, despite how used to it she had gotten. She slowed with the group just twenty minutes into the cave. Slowly beginning to set up camp, she took note to push away all the bones and set up a nice area nestled in the corner. She took a lot of time walking about and looking at the point from every corner she stood, trying to make sure she would be the last thing noticed in the cavern, if anything entered while she slept. She grumbled and settled in. Today had been hectic. She was surprised to see the panic in her heart was gone. She didn't know if she was succeeding in distracting her thoughts, or if she was still somehow in shock. But the more she thought about it, the more she just felt like it didn't matter. She was safe, and had not been violated. She snuggled into the bedding and spared a last look at Oso, who was looking to be taking the first watch this night as well. Crow sat in a high-up location, servicing his new rifle with a smile. She set her lantern up and rested the cold cup of water from her supplies on top. She couldn't find any tea, so she settled on a hot cup of water as she coiled up with nothing but her thoughts. Tempting fate, she closed her eyes, re-rolling the thoughts and events into her mind. That she had almost been raped, she'd almost been killed. To her surprise, panic didn't raise in her heart. She seemed utterly indifferent to the whole event. She just felt tired. She rolled the thoughts around in her head and finally nuzzled to her pillow. Good night. Footnote. Level 4 achieved. Perk added. Mysterious stranger. You have gained the attention of a mysterious stranger. A stranger who may jump in to help you in combat during sets.